The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92 000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Welcome to another Engine Room podcast. Today we have the pleasure of the dynamic duo from Moran Partners Financial Planning. We're joined by Dr. Paul Moran and Alex Hunt. We'll be attempting to wrangle these two giants of the industry and figure out what makes them tick. Have a look under the lid at their engine room and, and figure out while they're part of the solution of driving efficiencies in financial planning. So Alex and Paul, welcome to the Engine Room Podcast. Thank you, Roxy. Thanks for having us on. Really appreciate it. Great. And um, I'm also very happy to say that I've got someone who has been doing this and is obviously as insane as I am, who's been doing this from the mid 90s. And Paul, you kicked off the business in the early 90s. Um, I'd love yep. first to hear your journey because um, it's, it's quite remarkable. Um, and then after that, uh, Alex, I'd like to hear how the hell you've got involved and what keeps you there and what makes you um, uh, happy to be part of this journey. So, Alex, uh, sorry, Paul, over to you. Thanks, Roxy. Well, you're right. We started in. As a financial planner in 1995, I came to finance from an unusual source. Um, I'd been a paramedic for about 10 years. Um, during that time, as a paramedic, I did an MBA, and um, which, believe it or not, was not recognized as a management qualification in the ambulance service. So my ambition got the better of me, and I left and and got a job with, of all people, Westpac. Can, can I ask what, what, why, what, what, why you decided to do an MBA whilst being a paramedic? I would have thought that that would have been... A pretty intense vocation as a day job. Look, I had a I had a degree, an applied science degree, which which I'd used before and got me into ambulance service. I was actually the first person in Victoria's an ambo with a degree. They actively discourage people from degrees becoming an ambo, um, but I wanted to do a master's in, in something that was unrelated. So an MBA was something that interested me. At the time, we did an exam, you know, the, the GMAT exam, and I, I scored very very highly in that, so I sort of reinforced it. So I did an MBA over five years, did part time over about five years, um, but but I was probably too ambitious for the ambulance service to be honest. And, and so after about ten years, I left there. I, I'd also had enough of being an ambo. That's a, it's a pretty tough job. And went to Westpac at the time. Bob Joss had come over from America with Westpac to shake up Westpac, um, and he wanted to bring in people who had a marketing background. And my major was marketing in the MBA um, uh, to to shake up banking. Um, hated being a bank manager. It was a terrible job, but but that was at the time in the early, mid nineties when they were just introducing financial advice, and so I hopped across to financial advice. Uh, started as a financial advisor in Ed Westpac in ninety five. Um, within a couple of years, I was sort of the state training manager because you know they figured I had a degree and a master's, I, I must be good at training. So therefore, I became the training manager and probably trained the best part of a couple of hundred people as advisors at Westpac during that time of massive massive growth. A lot of who are still around in low and high profile jobs in in the profession now. So that that's how I kind of got in. But but I often describe the job as being quite similar to being an AMBO. Well, yeah, it, do it's, tell. It's, do tell. That's, well I think I think the the industry might have been in on life support for the last decade. So I'm really interested yeah. in your 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 uh, your take here. I mean I have told this story before to other people, but but 
the job of an AMBO is to know what to do. You know, no matter what situation you're going to, what, what horrible situation you're in, people used to always say the same words. They'd always say, it's okay, the ambulance is here now, right? And, and, and they weren't saying, I'm going to save lives. What they knew was I was wearing a uniform. I was expected to know what to do in that situation. And that chaos to calm is what we've carried through into our practice motto and how we operate because I strongly believe and my kind of other edu- educational background really confirms that the reason people don't seek advice is because they're embarrassed and frightened, not because it's too expensive or not because we're all crooks, but it's because they're embarrassed and frightened. And when they come in, they're coming in in this chaotic mindset. You know, I've got all these things swirling around my head, what's going to go wrong? And things like, have I left it too late? Have I got enough? All this embarrassment causes this chaos. And my job is to prove to them I know what to do. I can't control investment markets. I can't make money out of nothing, but I know what to do. There's a process to go through and explain that process to them um, calms them down and they walk out calm. And that's our job is to help them walk out calm with their finances. So chaos to calm. And uh, um, Alex, as a, as a counter to that, maybe a bit about your backstory and uh, and and uh, did your relationship with uh, Paul and the team start as chaotic and is it calm now? So a bit about yourself first. Yeah, sure. So look, I guess, um, you know, I sort of didn't quite know what to do coming out of high school, did a started in a business degree because in with hospitality and tourism as the major because the first year was going to be at Mount Buller and I thought, how good is this? It's going to be up at the snow. Um, got talked out of it because it was a bit too, it, you know, it sort of railroaded me into that that section and I sort of had a, I might have had a bit more opportunities in other areas if I did a straight business degree. Anyway, um, so I, I was at uni, um, I had dreadlocks at the time, uh, you know, living the life. Um, and my dad actually saw Paul present at one of the investment conferences that used to run at the exhibition center. And he'd become, he'd seen Paul he'd be, as a, as a client, potential client. And I think one day he, he saw Paul and he said, oh, look, you know, my son's keen. Are, are you looking at taking anyone on? And so, hence, I turned up to Paul's office in a shirt that I borrowed from my dad and with the dreadlocks and, and started working there one day a week. Um, at the beginning and and before coming on board full time. So legitimately, you uh, you had your first uh, interview with dreadlocks. And what year yeah. was that? Uh, I reckon that might have been two thousand and eight. Right. Okay. Look, Roxy, I might I might jump in and say that my, my wife worked in the business at the time, and one of the reasons we liked him coming in was because he had dreadlocks, and then he cut them off, and we were shattered that he cut them off. <laughs> Is that does that coincide with the the day that you were told you were seeing clients, Alex? No, no, it happened a bit before then. It, <laughs> you look, it just got to a point where they needed to go. <laughs> um, but I still miss them. Actually, I still have them, you know, stuck, tucked away in a bag somewhere at home. I couldn't get rid of them. That was that was a fun period of my life. That sounds like an eBay job in about just 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 part of yourself being super fun. Now, Paul, um, throughout your journey, um, has there been any sort of key cathartic milestones within that financial planning journey that 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 has um sort of uh, shape the way in which you deliver advice? Well, I think, um, well, coming out of the bank, you know, which was very sales focused, there's no question about that, very heavily sales focused. Uh, I always felt there was a better way. This is about uh, proper personal long term relationships. And I probably became very influenced by a book called The Trusted Advisor by Meister and Green, about, about which takes it away from regulation and into relationships and, and being um, that person that. Um, the client implicitly trusts for everything. Yeah, you know, we get phone calls for all sorts of reasons, um, and, and but perhaps my background is pretty broad, you know. And, and so, um, you know, we, we we can help people with well everything from choosing doctors to you know, you know, just all sorts of stuff that people come in and ask us about. And and, and that that process to me is something you can't do unless you're working for yourself. Uh, so. So being able to do what you want to do when you want to do it is something that's really important to me. And it's not. I'm not a corporate kind of a guy. This is, we don't run a corporatized kind of a business. It's it's a personalized business. And I often describe it as a family business. We see Alex and the other team as part of the family. Um, my wife worked in the business. My daughter worked in the business. My father, who's 80 years old, still does a job in the business. Um, you know, uh, So everyone's part of the family and, and we treat it that way. And I think the clients feel that way as well, part of a family. Well, quite often clients engage you as a family unit. So that makes a lot of sense. And I might just backtrack. The book that you mentioned was The Trusted Advisor. And who was the author, Paul, just so I can? Originally, it was Meister, M-E-I-S-T-E-R, and Green. Meister and Green. So they Thanks. wrote the original version, yeah. No, it's always good to to pull out some nuggets of gold for our listeners. 
um, and so that they can they can they can go on their journey. And and yep. Alex yourself, when you um, uh, started in financial planning, two thousand and eight. How many months under the desk were you until we had the, the the global financial crisis? And what did you learn from that? Look, I think I came in kind of in the middle of it, right? Or you know, it was February two thousand and eight when I started, and I didn't really know what was happening in investment markets or understand it, at particularly at the time. But you know, my sort of knowledge was starting to grow. Um, but yeah, look, we started writing plans and starting to take phone calls during that time. So yeah, really sort of got in in the thick of it. It was a good time to start. It's uh, I had a recent um, uh, a person on, and, and they started in um, uh, August 1987. So potentially, you've both picked a, a, the best time to start because it's um, uh, it's best to get those band aids ripped off. Um, so the actual business, um, Moran Partners. Um, maybe if I could just get a, just to paint a bit of the picture where you're located, and just sort of the the clients that uh, one you like to service and the clients that are attracted to you. Sure, I'll have a crack at that. Look, we're located in North Carlton in 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 the sub in the, in the Melbourne, in the north of Melbourne. Um, but we attract clients from all over the state, um, and some from interstate, um, mainly from refer- referrals. We don't really haven't gone out of our way to focus on developing referral sources. Uh, we tend to grow organically. We have a couple of accountants who refer through to us. But um, but primarily the stuff comes from word of mouth or the clients come from word of mouth. Now, there's a significant age difference between Alex and myself. And so we have a different kind of, not a core client base, um, but we have slightly different uh, types of clients who come to, come to see us. My, my clients have been around some for more than 20 years. So so uh, my clients are probably probably aged from from late 50s to 80s. But, but new clients coming in in that pre-retirement phase, which is typically when clients come and seek advice. From Alex's point of view, Alex, you can probably talk about your clients you, you tend to see. Yeah, sure. So I don't have that many in that retirement phase. I've got a lot probably starting, mostly starting around late 30s through to um, a, you know mid, mid-60s. So there are a few that we've taken on that are starting to hit that or have started to hit that retirement phase in the last um, few years. But uh, we also get a, a given where we are, we, we, we get a lot of clients inquiring um, about some ethical investment options. Um, and that tends to be another area that I focus on within the practice as well um, as the sort of, you know, the families, mortgage, that sort of, that sort of, you know, mid to late 40s, early 50s type client. And maybe tease out a bit more in relation to that ethical um, sort of aspect of it. Why is that? And then what, what do you bring to the table? I think it's just changing attitudes, but in particular in the sort of inner north of Melbourne, it tends to be very left-leaning um, and t- it's more typical of that sort of attitude towards not just investment, but I guess lifestyle as well. Um, and so I think we've seen it as an opportunity to to skill up in that area, to be able to provide that sort of a service to clients. So w- while we have some internal beliefs or, or ideas around ethical investing and how it should work and and pros and cons and um, we also have developed some tools and abilities to try and tailor what we provide to the clients to suit exactly what they want and that comes a little bit back to the questions that you ask um, and then how but then also having a solution and being able to to then provide something to meet the sort of answers to those questions that you get it, it's not a huge part of our business but it is certainly a trend that we've seen or I've seen particularly in the last five to six years and and I, I like to quite often uh, shift gears and talk about um, the practice of, of the practice next. But there was a section in your website which outlaid a professional consultation, which which kind of uh, appeared to be the bridge between providing information and people coming on board as a, a full client. Maybe if if one of you could just give a bit of a feel for that, because it's on your website, there is hourly rates and and there's a bit of a disclaimer. But I thought it was pretty neat. So um, over to you in relation to that particular bridge that you've built. Yeah. So I might jump in on that one, Al. Al we, we've we always had a view that everyone who walks in the door gets what we call the treatment. And, and, and the treatment is that- well, There's the expectation- ambulance uh, history coming out. That's right. So uh, you, you, an EpiPen. Everyone gets an EpiPen just to perk yeah. them up. But, but the expectation for us is when they walk out, no matter who's come in, they walk out thinking very positively about financial planning and very positively about us. And, and so- so everyone gets treated as if they've got $5 million. I don't care if they've got five cents. They all get treated the same way. Um, they get an explanation of what we do. They get some help and some tips along the way that we explain what we charge and how we operate. And we've talked about whether or not we think we can help them or whether there's value in the assistance. 
the professional consultation comes down to the sort of client who wants to come in and ask some specific questions. They don't want to become an ongoing client. They just want to ask some specific questions in a general advice kind of environment, but more than just seeing, do I want to use you as, your, as a financial advisor? So that's that's where the professional consultation comes in. But but the treatment's important because um, you know we don't want to be outwardly uh, disqualifying people. You know, obviously disqualifying. You know, you're not suitable for us, so you know, go away. We want everyone to be thinking positively. Hence, we have a constant stream of people coming in because because they talk about us in positive in a positive way. You know that, um, but by not by not trying to to disqualify them, in fact, by treating them with respect and and helping them where we can, they they tend to ref- even if they don't become clients, they tend to still refer to us, uh, and so we get a lot, lot of referrals. Well, some of and my I best think- clients have come from those people that came in, didn't become an ongoing client, but walked out with a great impression. And it might not be next week, it might be a month or two or even a year later, but someone comes in and you sort of, you know, we often ask, so, you know, how did you hear about us? Where did you find out about us? And they say, oh, I spoke to so-and-so, you know, a year ago and they said great things and I've just, you know, haven't got around to it, but here I am now. And then they've some, been some of the, the, the best clients I've taken on. And, and just to, um, you know, add, add some meat to, to that, um, you actually have articulated, um, you know, a, a fee for service for when people have, are doing that. It's on. It's on your website. It's a, you know, it starts at the associate of a, a associate of one hundred and sixty dollars and goes up to the senior partner. So, you know, this industry is attempting to move into a more professional uh, kind of uh, lens in in the general public. And, um, you know, historically, financial planners have been the only people, professional people, who've gone and done degrees and postgraduates who don't charge for their their first consultation. And I don't imagine that that the first time you ever did that, um, it was overly difficult to take money from people. Would that be correct? Correct. We often don't charge for the first appointment. I mean, that professional consultation is an option we say at the end of the meeting. Yep. If it is, if it seems to us you've come in just to get some questions answered, I'm going to I'm going to give you a bill. Yep. But if you've come in to genuinely see, you know, I'm looking for a financial planner and can you help me? Then then that's fine. That's what that's what it's, it's a part of the cost of doing business. You know. Absolutely, and 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 that's the bridge. And I think for a lot of people, um, uh, I think by putting a value to that as 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 actual or, or nominal as it is. Just positions you highly so that when they get to a juncture in the future when they need full financial advice, as Alex intimated, that they come back to you. So you've you've got this wonderful broad platform. Um, you've got this 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 stretch of ability as far as an age demographic um, that you can attract clients. You've got a great way of engaging them. But what I want to ask you next is how the what happens next? How do you actually run the business? So so maybe Alex, if you could give me a bit of an idea of the organisational structure. Because um, you know, from previous conversations, you you are you are, you are self licensed. You run some stuff, but I'd just be keen to hear how that operates seamlessly. So those client experience or the treatment, as you intimated, um, is smooth from 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 that aspect. Yeah, sure. So we are self licensed, which um, you know, as Paul sort of mentioned, gives us the ability to to make some decisions and have a bit of autonomy around how we do the the operation of providing advice. Um, we tend to operate in a kind of a pod structure with the advisors and their client bases. Um, and so while we have a f- we, we kind of have three running at the moment with the way that the advisors are set up, one of them is particularly bigger than the others but also has a bit more resources sitting behind it. Um, but, yeah, you're right. There is a challenge sometimes in making sure that it's consistent, especially from a license point of view. But I guess that's where you start leaning on some of the tech stack at a license level. You know, what, while we do operate as pods and have some autonomy – um, within those pods, it, we, we've made some decisions around, okay, well, how do we manage this at a license level and, and for, across all advisors so that, that we're all on the same, using the same sort of platforms, using the same processes with an ability to tailor those as the advisor likes. But we, we usually discuss that as a, more as a team. Um, if, something, if there's something that someone wants, we're not, um, you know, we're not tyrants. Um, we try and accommodate if it's going to work. And so you've got the three the three pods, as you say. One one one's a bigger one. That's probably got to do with history and just just um, uh, a scale. Um, and and um, you ha- you share the commonality of the licensing, so the the governance and whatnot. Um, you you've also also mentioned there that you share the um, the uh, sort of investment management. So what, 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 do you operate an MDA or an SMA, or, or is that is that a commonality? Because in these particular structures that. That is historically what's been done. Well, what do you guys do? Yeah, so I mean, while we do operate as pods, the commonality does come back to um, 
the investment management side, starting an MDA. I think we started back in June or June 2014. So we we wow. we made we made some decisions a few years ago when we you know Paul and I were doing some research around um, managing portfolios with the dynamic asset allocation and how do we manage and and balance downside risk in particular in managing asset allocation um, for clients. You know we we had a lot of clients on platform. If we, we, we had a look at actually how do we implement this sort of dynamic asset allocation where we're looking at a few particular indicators at, at really it was around changing the equity allocation. And so, but practically to, to implement that and actually roll it out would require a huge number of person hours to write the ROAs and then actually to, to physically action the transactions one by one. Now, this back in 2014, we didn't have some of the model portfolio tools that are around on platforms today and that the smart ROAs and those sorts of things. So we went down the path of looking at, well, what else can we do? Um, and the obvious standout was using a managed discretionary account service. Now, we didn't have an MDA license um, at that point. We were self-licensed at that point, but we didn't have an MDA license. And so we had to look at who we could partner with and and, and we became appointed as the investment managers um, on the platform. Now, even though we have the different pods, um, we we have an investment committee that was set up at the time, which we all sit on. And so we all have a consistent view across the practice as to what our investment philosophy is and how those portfolios run and even the portfolio decisions that get made. So there is a little consistency across for all clients across that. So I liken um, the engine room to running a Formula One. And uh, and and quite often the the the, the engine room is the, the pit team, um, is the design team, um, and the advisors are the, uh, are the are the race drivers. The departure here is is that yeah, it's still the case in that the engine room and all the operations is is done by the pit crew. Um, your advisors are the race drivers, but every so often the advisors have a meeting together to see whether or not they can build a better race car. Would that be fair to say? I think that's right. I think we we have a a uniform approach. While, while we not every client sits in the MDA, we have, by the way we have an MDA and an SMA. Offering depending on the platform and the and the uh, trustee or non trustee, um, but the but portfolios are the same. We just found that having uniform portfolios like that in that structure allows us to have I think f- up to fifty percent more clients per, per advisor um, because because the the risks and the workload around transactions is re- reduced to almost nothing. Um, you know the process of changing a portfolio takes someone Alex does most of it, but physically but but that process of changing from from a product a to product b within a portfolio or increasing or decreasing allocation is a is done in a, in a matter of an hour across the entire portfolio so it's not or sometimes it's we, in we minutes can, we can really. do it in minutes um yeah. it's just a, yeah a little bit more care and attention sometimes yeah. you're coming up to 10 years as an mda so in 2023 what, what's the platform that you, you you run through and um and and do you uh, sort of yeah what's the platform that you place most of your MDA money with? So the MDA runs on, um, well, we started, it was called managedaccounts.com.au, uh, which is then rebranded as Explore Wealth, um, which was recently bought by Hub uh, a few years back, but still running under the Explore badge, um, Explore Wealth badge. So actually, we also run an SMA with the same portfolios on the Macquarie platform. So Macquarie offered us to put uh, two of our two of our portfolios, uh, which are income focused on their platform. So uh, Explore didn't have a trustee option at the time, and so uh, the, the trustee version sits sits with uh, with Macquarie. Well, you, well you've uh, you've had to hustle because you were very early adopters. Um, in relation to the types of clients, and, and this is probably directed to yourself, Alex, given the demographic of your clients being younger, does your um, does your business uh, offer life insurance as part of it, or do you refer out? What? How do you handle? How do you handle the life insurance advisory component? And then importantly, how do you actually implement it? And make money. Yeah, good question. I, I guess I started doing a lot of the insurance for the practice um, going back a number of years and, and sort of took over that part within the practice. So when people would come through, um, particularly the risk only people, I'd look after them. But even then, you know, uh, we'd refer internally within the practice. So yes, we do it. I, I have to say that the, the risk only part is not something we really want to do. We still do it, um, but it's it's not something that we... We really love doing it, it. It is a challenge to try and make it profitable. We've tried to move as much as we can towards a fee for service model, um, and I, I've had a tough time trying to figure out how to price that risk only 
advice in a fee-for-service model? I, I liken it to um, the issue with fee-for-service is uh, I'm pretty sure that anyone who's got to the hospital after being delivered there by an ambulance after the fact is more than happy to pay a fee-for-service for the ambulance. But anyone moments before that tragic accident probably doesn't see value in it. Is that the correct analogy? Um, I don't. Th- I'm not sure if it's exactly the case. I think where you run into a bit of trouble with fee for service is often that year one piece when you're asking the client to pay not only the insurance premiums but then to also pay the fee on top. So that that's all. You know, they're paying twice in year one, and they while you can explain the benefits of looking at um, you know your discounted premiums over the years of the policy, um, it. Yeah, that that's where it becomes a little bit more unpalatable in, in the in the first year because they, you know, as you know, insurance costs can be significant, especially when you're putting in an appropriate level of cover, um, or you 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 identify to the client here are all the areas of risk that we see or gaps in your in your insurance program, and here's what it's going to take to cover them, and unfortunately, here's what it costs. So I I think it's it's not so much that people are are not willing to pay; it's just there is a level, there is a point where they say that's just too much. I just can't, I can't go that far. I can't pay that much for, for you know, that, that much of an outlay to put this in place. Yeah, that's fair enough. And um, having your own license also gives you the ability to make other decisions, um, such as whether you have contractors in-house or out-house or, or whether you, uh, or what the composition of, of your tech stack would be. So maybe out of those two, I might just start with the, the tech stack. What what is the the tech stack um, um, that Moran has? And I do know the answer to part of this because we've had a, a chat off air, and I I'm, I can't wait to elaborate more. But but Alex, yeah, what's what's the the tech stack of how you guys deliver your advice? Yeah, so right now um, we we've been in work sorted as our CRM for a long time. Given that we're self licensed, we also have the 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 job of managing revenue, collecting and managing revenue, and then matching it off against clients. And work sorted seemed by far the most efficient and cost-effective way for us to do that. Um, it also comes with all the, you know, the workflows, the task management, the compliance record, um, the ability to, to communicate. So, that that sort of forms the basis of where we start. Um, what we then have to look at is how do we add the advice tools? Um, so, things like we still use XPlan, XTools Plus. Um, we have Marcus in our practice who I don't think will ever be able to leave XTools Plus yeah, I think we've tried. We've looked at other options, and he, he's it he just absolutely wedded to it. Mind you, mind you, it is still probably the best cash flow model and tool around. So nothing against that. Um, but we we often use Voyant as the uh, ca- as the cash flow modeling or projections tool. It's really client friendly. It's very visual. Um, even if it sometimes can't tease out some of the more complex scenarios, it does a really good job most of the time. One of the key parts that we use we, is. You know, when we tried to move away from this idea of a paper fact find, um, and I, I'd love to take some credit for this one, but but really, Paul decided that, that the paper fact find wasn't good enough, so I'm gonna he's gonna build his own platform. So I might throw to you, Paul, just to talk through I fact find, which is another key um, component of our tech stack and and the things that it can do. Yeah, sure. So Rock, have you keep going, Roxy. So what? I guess uh, look about five and a half years ago, uh, myself and my now business partner sat down and looked at looked at what technology was missing in advice and um, start the process of identifying that in fact where it starts is the client data that's where everything starts client information and holding client information in the uniform source detailed holistic editable updatable you know where clients can add advisors can add is where I fact find started it's got a long way to go uh, the fact find itself is I think I'm going to say it's the best fact find in the market you'd expect me to say that but but um, you know it, it it's got a long way to develop further into what we wanted to get it to be, which is a lot more than just a fact find. <clears throat> but but the fact find tool enabled us to get this really deep understanding about the clients. Um, what we were finding was that the paper-based fact find is pretty superficially completed. Um, my estimate would be that around about 20 to 25% of a paper-based fact find gets completed when, when it gets filled in, and the advisor then fleshes out the rest over, over a period of time. And that sits in his head or in file notes or in bits of sticky paper or whatever, we wanted somewhere that that everything could be put in the one spot, uh, where the clients could interact with it. They could log in. They could have a client portal, so we avoided the ability to send sensitive information to them via email. Um, uh, so, so we've got a lot more flexibility around how we deliver stuff. And um, so, this is ifactfind.com.au. If I'm just I'm reading it as you're going through. And um, uh, when you started doing that for your own business. 
um, and making those connections. At what stage did you think that um, I'm solving a problem for my own business that might actually be useful for others? I oh, probably um, <clears throat> after we'd spent fifty grand, and I thought I'd better start trying to look at the, making some extra money on this. And we're, we're, we're a long, long, long way past there now. But uh, but but it, it is it, it, the more people I spoke to, the more people who said to me we're using paper. And, and in fact, my estimate is that, that more than ninety percent of people in the market that in the place at the moment are still using paper or something similar to collect data, editor or PDF or, or, or paper. Um, very few are using a, a digital format. Um, some are using Excel, all sorts of things, which are static and no much no, no different to a paper. So we wanted to build something that was that was genuinely holistic, not not geared towards selling a product, but genuinely holistic about gathering as much information about the client as we can and having that live and updated and real in real time. So, and you've got that feeding into um, uh, any of your other pieces of software at the moment, Paul? Yeah, so it feeds into WorkSorter, it feeds into XPlan. Um, as of the end of next week, it'll feed into Voyant, um, feeds into Fin three six five. And progressively, uh, Q3 this year, it'll feed into um, to Practify and into Midwinter and more to come. So, Alex, when you, um, when you sit down there and, and say, oh, I think we, we should do something with technology, you've always got to be very wary because Paul will just go off into his garage and start building something. Is that, is that the problem you face from an executive perspective, mate? No, but any time we do have the tech stack talk, I, you know, I have to... Um, we have this joke that Paul's now the CEO of a software company, so his his opinion has to carry a lot of weight. Uh, well, for all those private equity, that just means you're 100 times multiple. So uh, but there you go. That that might be part of it. But um, you mentioned something uh, about keeping things off email because of uh, security and um you know the the, the cyber security and, and data breaches is very topical. Um, uh, with with you know the biggest companies in Australia falling victim to it. You you mentioned um, you you have people working within your office, and you've also got people working remotely. Um, Alex, how how do you manage that? From from mainly, I'm interested in how you manage that from an operational and security, and then then after that, Paul, I might might ask you a few questions in people and culture if you don't mind. So so over to you, Alex. Yeah, sure. So I, I guess you know, there's the password managers um, are a crucial thing. And really staying within the the office, Microsoft Office 365 or Microsoft 365 ecosystem, where we have a lot of control and oversight around um, who's accessing what and where. Um, most of our operations happens within the office. We do have a um, shout out here quickly to virtual business partners as well. So we've got a couple of people working for us for them. So they've been great the last little while and really helped. But there is that challenge of, of working internationally. And so, it, really, it's just having sort of good hygiene procedures around how you manage access, how you manage logins, how you send information. We're, we're, I'm a little bit paranoid about cybersecurity, so I hope that makes us proactive, um, or I like to think we're proactive in that space, and I don't think we ever, we're ever at a point where we're exactly comfortable. And so, things like the IFAC Find portal where we can share documents with clients is fantastic. Um, internally, we try not to email um, really any in, in personal information. It's all done through portals or through the, the, the Microsoft Teams where it's a bit more of a closed loop. Um, but we also have, yeah, someone working in Point Lonsdale who is at, it's about a couple of hours away. So there, there is, it is really a hybrid sort of setup between the office and home. And it, it, but using those sort of tech tools, it works really easily. And I think we've got a pretty good, we've, we've got a reasonable level of, of security or cyber security awareness around what we're doing. Yeah, and I think um, uh, uh, by having that awareness and and by using you know uh, anything anything but email, I think is if you talk to a, a cyber security specialist, I think they've even got an acronym for that. And uh, if you're listening to this um, and you you think just because you're on a on a on an email system sending information, it's probably yeah, well, it is the weak point. Um, what was the password management tool that you used, Alex? Just we use LastPass. Um, it's been amazing. I know they've had a, a couple of uh, incidents lately, but they're still a way better system than anything we've used prior to that. Yeah, look, I, I'm I'm a LastPass person as well, and, and it, for a couple of reasons: one, data security, and the other one is when you get older, you just start forgetting passwords. Yeah, there's only, only so many uh, pet names that you've got, um, and you've even start forgetting your pet names. So well, I think, um, you're I think in that one's the biggest that one's the biggest producti- productivity pickup that we've had in the last five years, right? And I know it's a simple one and it's not as sexy as some of the other advice tools, but 
um, by far and away, I think it's made the biggest difference to, to, to our sanity in the office. So we've now got a bit of a, f- a feel for for um, uh, your business. Um, you've got a bit of a feel for the, for the pods. Paul, you have crafted this business. You mentioned you've had a lot of family influence. You, your child has worked there. Your, your, your parents have worked there. Your wife has worked there. Um, and so uh, a part of your recruiting process is obviously, um, you know, a marriage certificate or thereabouts. But in the event that they're not somehow related to you, what I love to ask is, why do people join your firm? Why do they stay and why do they grow? Look, I think we treat them as family. That That's the thing we do. We, we don't treat this as a business. I mean, I, I have a, a strong view that I'm a practitioner and this is a practice. And that's different to other people. Other people treat their businesses as businesses. Business first, you know, financial planning second. We've always treated this as a practice and we're, we're practitioners first and foremost. And that allows us to focus on our clients and uh, first and foremost and focus on our staff um, so, so I, we generally do treat them like family. We, we, we know their birthdays. We, we go out together. We, you know, we, we, we care for them. You know, we really do care for everyone. And, and I think they know it and they care for us. You know, it works both ways, you know. And so we, 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 we cover for each other. We know what's going on. Uh, it's a little tight net community and people, people like that. You know, we're, we're, we're pretty flexible in how we, how we operate. You know, if someone can't come in because they're sick or they've got kids to look after, we just cover it. You know, it's, it's just done that way and it works well together. But, but it is, it is it is a you know it is a personal business we're in, and, and the more we try and commercialise it, the less personal it becomes. Well, to us, it's not how we want to operate. And and look, um, whilst you were saying that, um, in, in a in an action that's completely not built for podcasting, Alex is nodding. So, Alex, maybe if I could just get you to maybe verbalise your thoughts. Um, for a few seconds, because uh, and now you're nodding, Paul. We're going to have to run through this again sometime. Sure. Over to sure. you, Alex. Look. I've um, really enjoyed the the other podcasts that you've done in the engine room. And I think there's a few people that have come out, you know, that have said we've been very deliberate in the culture that we've built and we've got, you know, we've listed out a few things, that are the key lines and the mission statements and the like. <laughs> and I think that's great. But I think for us, we've been a little bit different. And I think you have to, have to look at where it starts. And it starts at the top with Paul. Um, but we don't have a formal culture handbook or a, a mission statement and, and what Paul says about um, us caring for people that is just part of what 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 happens at the place and it does start at the top with Paul and, he, and his wife in particular who I you know I, it does feel like a family to me I've been here 15 years now and um, haven't ever really thought about leaving um, at all no it's barely crossed my mind um, in the, in the 15 years to look at anything else and and I can't imagine going anywhere else and I, I made a joke with um with Marcus, who started with us, I think in 2014, um, who he'd the been a para- the, the new guy. That's right. He'd been a paraplanner um, at the time. He'd been a paraplanner just about everywhere. He lived down in Point Lonsdale. He'd been a paraplanner all over Geelong. He'd worked for any number of different firms. And I made a joke to him when he joined. I said, "Oh, you know, great to have you on board. You're never going to leave." And he just looked at me and thought, "You know, what an idiot." Of course, you know, why would you say that? And here we are, however many years later, um, and he's not going anywhere. He loves it. So I think it starts at the top with Paul, um, and I think it's the, it's the case with a lot of organisations. It starts with the leader um, who, or whoever's whoever's running the place, um, and you have to set the example. Well, I also think that having a really clear articulation of how you engage people, having a very transparent uh, uh, philosophy from what you're doing with them to the billing, um, it just means that it doesn't. It, it, you don't have that anxiety. Um, it's there in front of you. People make decisions to work with you or they don't. And I think by, by being upfront and, and as transparent as possible um, does probably liberate you from those other stresses about, you know, is this going to happen? I don't know. You know, so is, would you agree with that that sentiment? Yeah, I think, look, we, we have a bit of a policy. Uh, I know it sounds ridiculous. So this, I've never making an outbound call to a prospective client. So when someone comes and sees us, we send them away after the first meeting and we never call them. We, we wait for them to call us. We've got enough confidence in our process that they will eventually call. Sometimes that's a year, two years, even five years later. But but as soon as we start chasing up people, putting pressure on them to become clients, then it changes the nature of the relationship. So we, we have this policy of never making an outbound call to a prospective client. They've got to ring us. Does that come from the trusted advisor sort of philosophy that you mentioned early on? Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah, We've got to trust, trust what we do is good enough, you know, and- and we'll talk in a minute about maybe the statement of advice, but our statements are bespoke. 
Um, you know, we 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 well, let's write talk them. now about them. You know, let's All talk right. about yeah, absolutely. Right. So I I have a really really strong view that the reason people don't read statements of advice is, is because they're rubbish. Right? Uh, we we have trouble. Is rubbish whereas, an acronym, or it is what you just said? <laughs> it is what it is just said. Now, I've been I've been I've been marking marking assignments on on this SOS for a long long time, and they're not getting any better. So all the talk about uh, video SOAs, which is all great. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but but the fact of the matter is, it's an excuse because we have trouble writing and articulating a proper statement of advice. You know, I, I know we get people picking up statements of advice for us, and on page 42, they're picking up spelling mistakes, which is a good indication they're reading the damn thing, and the, and they read the thing because it sounds like I'm talking. Alex's sound like he's talking. John's sound like he's talking. It's written in a narrative style. It's verbal. It's not. A, it's not an excuse to sell a product. It's about strategy. It's about understanding. We understand what their needs are, and here's how we're going to meet your needs. And so that that's hard to put down into a really, really quick, efficient process. Um, we, we're, we're always striving to make it more efficient, but but the output that little document we give the client is the basis of the relationship, and, and it's what they're paying for. They're paying three, four, five, six thousand dollars for that piece of paper, um, which is comes with our expertise. I get that, but that's what they're paying for. And if they can't read it, it doesn't make sense to them, and they're going to just put it in the file because they can't be bothered. Then that's terrible. It's a terrible, terrible outcome. So I think we need to be better at producing statements of advice uh, for clients and have have them readable and understandable, rather than moving down the path of you know all this new technology sort of stuff. And I think. That's well, how long? When did you get your license? When did you become self licensed? Just a quick question. Two thousand thirteen. Two thousand and thirteen. End of two thousand and twelve. I think that um, being self licensed does give you the ability to back um, to back yourself and back your advice because you're not all thrown into the risk bundle of of of, of everyone. I, I feel that larger advice practices or larger licensees are coming to the party as much as they can um, with with that sentiment. And I love, I love writing in the narrative. I'm actually not smart enough to not write in the narrative. So um, if it doesn't feel like someone's talking to me, then um, I probably am not engaged. So I completely and utterly um, agree with with that as far as um, the SOAs. Now, what I, a quick question I had in relation to um, people and culture is, you've got um, different pods that you you you, you operate, and Clearly, you must you you've, you've got some targets for them. Um, you know whether it be uh, throughput for for clients or maybe even meeting new clients, that sort of thing. When you do achieve them, how do you celebrate? You know what what does what does um, a celebration at Moran look like, and and what what triggers them? Uh, apart from obviously getting a year older being a birthday, I'm more interested in performance or or, or, or team based ones. You know, Roxy, we don't do that. We don't have targets. We don't have KPIs. We don't have expectation. Everyone operates their own little business on their, on their own pace. And if, 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 if having a couple of kids and slowing down for a couple of years is important to you, then that's fine with us. You know, we, we don't, we haven't taken the path of setting up, uh, you know, KPIs for everyone and, and, and having ex- strong expectations of what you should be doing. Everyone who works here works well. They work hard when they're here. If they need to have some time, they have some time off. It's different things for different people. Alex has got three little kids. Terrific little kids who we love coming in. And John's got one one young child, and so if, if if that means that they can't work for a couple of days because the kids are sick, well, that, that's fine. There's no point putting incredible pressure on them to. It's it's their income. They they earn their own income, so there's no need for that sort of stuff. Yeah, so so we it's don't self-fulfilling, have basically. A it's a, um, yeah, I think yeah. Uh, you know I'm reading um, Macquarie Banks. I think they've got the their, their next incarnation of one of their books out at the moment, and. Um, uh, it's called the loose tight principle, or you know, freedom within boundaries, which is very much that. Which is, um, you, they can make as much as they want. They can have the freedom. They've got a little boundaries, um, but but it sounds very similar that you you're allowing people to to have a lifestyle bent or or or, or move up or or achieve. Um, and and does that does that resonate with you, Alex? Yeah, look, it it absolutely does. Um, you know, you're the master of your own destiny. I just want to a little backstory as well. Um. You know, I grew up when my with watching my dad, who became self-employed, um, running a telecommunications business, um, and we got to a point where my mum got really ill, uh, was terminally ill actually when I was a, a teenager, and in fact a little bit before then. And and being able to watch my dad do not necessarily work less hard, but have the flexibility to work around that and and make those arrangements was really inspiring in in that way, and so sort of something I always wanted to to have a look at, and so. 
I think we are a bit more of that sort of a lifestyle firm where you can make the job fit a little bit within your lifestyle. And with that said, I don't think anyone doesn't work hard. Um, you know, I know we've got someone who works nearly seven days a week, maybe not full days every day, but he, he, he's up and at it and um, just doesn't stop. And, you know, the rest of us, we sort of have to fit in a little bit sometimes around, um, you know, working late into the night or early into the morning. And I think, uh, Roxy, I've heard you, you are a member of the 5am club or at least were at one point. <laughs> um, I've heard that before. So, you know, even if it's not necessarily the nine to five, you're in here, you know, before nine and leaving after six and, you know, that sort of a, 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 lot, a sort of way of working, I would say that everyone's got their nose to the grindstone. And and we chatted beforehand, and and I, I said um, to to both of you, you know, would you like what what would be the call to action at the end of this? You know, are you looking to attract advisors and whatnot? And you kind of uh, you you were you were less than committal, but I'm going to actually articulate that 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 premise now. So exactly what 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 Alex has just intimated there, and 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 thank you very much for your for your 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 um sort of backstory and and your your inspiration. I really appreciate that. If you're an advisor where you also want to be able to be empowered and 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 you know be able to tackle whatever life throws at you in a, in a family environment, I think that's your your point of sales difference. I think that's your you know your, your, your articulation. So that would be what I would lead with um, if anyone was interested in, in in that as 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 a change from where they possibly are now um, in in Victoria. We, we do have space in the office, Roxy. I'll just say that. So. <laughs> it's because you don't have ping pong tables. Um, so um, <laughs> we have, we have remote control race. We have remote control race cars, though. Oh wow! Okay, so we're gonna we'll have a link to that um, in in the descriptor. <laughs> um, now, in relation to uh, the uh, the actual business itself and other things, um, I always ask the question: uh, Do you guys uh, involve yourself in any any giving back? Uh, I know, Paul, you've got significant uh, sort of uh, lineage in in in. In academia, I know that you give you've got your own podcast series where you, you put sort of tips and, and and things out to the universe, which um you know it must be rare being interviewed rather than doing it the other way around. But is there any other things that that you as a group or individually um support? I mean, primarily Alex has been running for a long time, uh, which has had a little hiatus lately. But the Masters of Finance podcast, I know we get back on that a bit shortly. From 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 my point of view, my my, my kind of extracurricular is is around. Um, well, well, was now the FAAA, um, and also I'm on the academic advisory panel of the FPSB, Financial Planning, International Financial Planning Standards Board, and rewriting a couple of textbooks. So it's not um, third party stuff. It's, it's more within the profession to try and promote the profession as much as possible. But Alex does a great podcast. I reckon he's 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 very very on on board with it. He's really good. So yeah, um, and, and, look, look, and, and it's entirely findable on your website, which will be part of. Yeah part of this as well. So in relation to um, the future, okay, so the fu- I'm interested, you know, as this is an engine room podcast and, you know, you've, you've, you've mentioned how you deliver advice and that starts from how you engage the clients, yeah. um, how you've used technology, you, you've used stuff, you've bought, you're, you've, you've built, you've had your courage and your own conviction, you're efficient, you're data secure, you're using some um, in office and some outside of office and outside of country resources, what do you see as the the type of practice into the future or maybe even the types of different financial planning practices? I'm going to get opinions from both of you. Maybe I'll start with you, Paul, and come to you next, Alex. Look, I think I think there's going to be a divergence between there'll be the large corporatized offices, you know, with, with, with 10 to 50 advisors, you know, running a large business in that sense. And then at the smaller end, I think there'll be collaborations, more and more collaborations where there'll be, I think it's going to be harder and harder. It's still to- totally possible, but harder and harder for a one-man office like it used to be. I think we've got four advisors in this practice. That's about right, I think. It's about the right number. But even that, we could probably benefit from having two or three practices working in a bit of a collaborative way. Maybe maybe some, even some more shared resources. We share resources amongst the four of us. But maybe across practices, sharing some resources might be the way to go. So some more collaborations. I think that's going to allow us to be able to bring people in for their professional year, because it's very hard in a small business to bring someone in for a year, um, you know, and pay them to be unproductive for twelve months um, and run the risk of going to leave. Yeah, across across two or three practices and sharing the resource might be a way to go. So 
you know, I, I don't think we have to have practices of 10 or 20 people, but we might have to have practices of two, three or four people linked to other practices of two, three or four people. That's because where I think that we'll would go. then have the intellectual economies of scale on the investment side and, and the, the operational economies of scale on, on, on the throughput and the, the delivery of advice. Is that, that correct? Yeah, I think so. Yep. And, and Alex, what do you see as, um, as the, the, the future of advice practices, given that uh, you know, you're quite a bit younger than both Paul and myself? Sure. Um, look, I actually probably echo what Paul has just said. I think having seen a f- and spoken to a few other people and talked to, in, to you know advisors over the journey that have worked in some of the bigger practices, um, and then even to the one man bands or the one person bands, um, I think you're probably going to end up with these sort of small to medium sized practices that are the ones really? that are that are going uh, to continue right. to work mm-hmm. really well. And I think they'll swallow up some of the the one person. Um, operations, which I've seen a little bit in the last few years, there's a few people that have sort of that were doing their own thing have decided it's pretty difficult if I'm just on my own. Plus, I think also you miss the camaraderie. Um, there's the social aspect, not just the, the financial planning aspect, and and being able to what was it? Someone said um, uh, a burden shared is a burden halved, right? And so sometimes when you are you know in the thick of it and you really just head down inside your work and and things go wrong, having other people to assist, bounce things off, I think it's really beneficial. So from a p- practice point of view, I think where we're going to get to, where, where are we going to see the most innovation and is still around that four to 10 person kind of practice, a four to 10 advisor practice with the right support staff underneath them. And I think there's actually some uh, some data saying that, that that's a, a quite reasonably efficient number. Um, it's it's pretty obvious that, that uh, um, subscale practices are going to struggle um, not because their their intentions are poor, but just the, the cost of cost of service and efficiency. Um, it, it's hard enough to deliver um, something the clients want in a time frame that they expect, um, even with all the resources in the world. Um, but to do that with one arm tied tie behind your back is tough. Uh, my observations are that, that that practices will continue also to get specialised in the types of advice that they give. Um, you know, at one one end of the spectrum, they might be just aged care specialists or they might be, um, you know, into just the, a certain type of, of business. And, and and that might be for your practice over time. That might be something that, that gets played out a little bit more. Um, the other parts of, of it, and I'm, I'm Paul, back to yourself, given that you've got um, exposure uh, to the international um, uh, standard sports, where do you see, um, and I don't normally ask this question, but I don't normally get this opportunity. Um, where do you see uh, Australian financial planning practices and, and, and operations sitting um, against some of our global counterparts? Roxy, we are so far in front of the rest of the world. It's not funny as far as our operations and how we do financial planning. So the US would be at least 85% investment advisors. Um, no more than 10 or 15% would be holistic advice. They're investment advisors first and foremost. Um, the UK gets swamped with, with pension management. And, and and not a lot else. So we, in a holistic sense, if we think in the for me in the perfect world, we're all holistic advisors, right? We we deal with a holistic person and everything, make all their needs financially. Um, the processes we go through, the 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 qualifications, the education that we have, is is a mile ahead of, of everyone else I've seen um, around the world. Just unfortunately, our regulator doesn't recognise that uh, because we also have the strictest and most rigid regulatory framework of anywhere in the world as well. So it's it's a it's a real challenge that um, you know that we we haven't been recognised for, for we are we're focusing on the bad apples all the time, um, uh, and that's mainly I guess a function of perhaps the big end of town running advice for a long time, you know, and, and the challenges of having a big end of town with 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 KPIs with sales targets and everything else that went with it. But as far as the physical process, the average good quality financial advice does here, it it stands as top top of the tree as far as everywhere else. No, that's that's. I mean, that's really good news. And if you're listening to this, and you're wondering what the rest of the world are doing, then um, we we are we are ahead of 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 the world. We are um, hamstrung yeah. by by the, the the complexities that regulation has put on us. But the best will survive, and 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 it is. It all comes down to can you create an environment for your advisors to give the best quality advice? And I think that um, I've really enjoyed chatting with both of you today. We've managed to keep. The, the the three person one running very smoothly. I thank you thank you both very very much for that. 
And if anyone would like to find out more about anything that's there, we're going to include a lot of links, both to the the technology that was was referenced, um, the IFAC find. Um, we've got a, a few links to the guys. Alex, we won't we we won't put too much pressure on you to continue those podcasts. What with three kids um, running around, um, and the other uh, as a parting question, a parting sort of request. I always ask um, afterwards for a photo that we can put out as a puff piece, um, and I don't know how much money needs to exchange hands, but that photo of Alex coming into the office with the dreadlocks and Paul interviewing them back in 2014, I think would be a must. And if I could get that one, then I think this would probably rate pretty highly. What's the chances? Might have to do a bit of work on the Photoshop because I don't know if we actually recorded it, but I reckon we can pull something together, Roxy. Alex has got a great picture of himself dressed as a pirate with, with those dreadlocks. So we can get one of those and photos from me and Alex. That might be the way to go. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for sharing some time on the Engineer podcast. Um, what is what is ob- absolutely obvious to me is that best practice comes in all shapes and sizes. And in relation to the, your business and, and, and the things that keep people in your business you've obviously got some secret sauce there so without any further ado i'd like to thank you for being on the engine room and i wish you all the success in the future cheers guys thanks roxy it's been great thanks roxy really appreciate it